Greetings, everybody. You are now looking at our beautiful faces. By our beautiful faces, I am, of course, referring to myself, Dave LeClaire. And with me, as always, from England, greetings, Mr. James everybody. Bruce. How's it you going, Mr. James Bruce? My entire party just got wiped out by one single guy who was waiting for me. You had it coming. And also joining me is Ugh. Rob Wiesahan. What's up, Rob? I drive cars and video games. Are you? Would you say that you are a professional video game car driver? Uh, about as professional as they get. That as far is, as that spectrum goes. That seems reasonable. I think I just may have realized that something is wrong with my mic. We'll find out in a second. What's that funny sound? Is that you? Yeah, I'm hearing, I'm hearing a slight hum. I don't know what's going on. The world is broken. We'll find out in a minute if my mic is broken. Well, it is, because I can hear you. What do you mean you can hear me? I can hear you humming away, so can Rob. Unless you've got, like, your phone sitting on your microphone or something. I don't think I do. I don't hear anything. I, I can't hear the Twitch stream because if I hear it, then I will break everything and make it echo. So now I'm not. I need. We need to wait for someone to tell us if we're broken. But I don't like the way the microphone is not bouncing enough in OBS. That is scary for me. Pyro Sharpie says he can hear us all. So okay. Why is it not? Maybe I. Whatever. Uh. So without Dave sounds very low. Scudderman says. Turn it up. You always sound really low, though. You either sound really low or really high. You don't seem to... I am as loud as I am able to go. But when I'm hitting this microphone... Oh, it is using my stupid headset microphone instead of my actual microphone. Why are you doing this to me, stupid... Wow, you're an idiot. <laughs> so we'll just use this for today. So see you later. The other <laughs> mic. Don't need you for now. Uh, so there we go. So James, you have actually purchased, I believe, and are playing a game this week. I can barely hear you at all now. What the hell have you done? Oh, right. Hold on. You just talk about your game that you're playing for a second. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So yeah, I actually, I actually bought a game in the Steam sale. I bought uh, Wasteland 2. Uh, though it apparently also comes with Wasteland the original. Not that I'm ever going to play that because I don't really do that. Um... It's a party-based top-down RPG. Basically, it's like old-school Fallout. It's what Fallout 3 should have been, which is exactly what I'm looking for in a game. Uh, you play as these mercenary rangers, like random police force that emerged once the world ended. I don't know if that changes later on, depending on your actions, but I suspect it might. And I haven't given up on Divinity yet, by the way. This just really caught my eye. And, and when you're pressed for time like I am, you have to kind of prioritize a little. And yes. I'm, I'm, I'm not really that far into it. So I haven't explored all the mechanics yet. I've been playing for about three hours and I kind of suck. Um, just like Divinity, it's like really, really norm, uh, difficult, really, on normal setting. It's kind of brutal. Uh, one aspect I really like so far is the choices you make have like a real impact on the game. So it's not just about closing down dialogue boxes and things. Like the first mission you do, you have to choose between two cities and which one you're going to go rescue. One of them is being like attacked by raiders. And the other one that I chose to go to has like mutant plants or something. And then halfway through that mission, I get a call from the other city going, oh, we're, we're really dying here. And then the last call I got from them was, was like the raiders having taken over the city. And they're like, ha ha ha, rangers, we've taken this city. So it actually makes a really big difference with where you choose, and I think there's going to be lots of those kind of choices later on in the game. Do you think uh, that was like a? Do you think that was like a static scripted experience, or was it like you know raider territory power level reached X, therefore place was taken over? I don't know if I'd have if I abandoned the current mission and went over there. I might have still had a chance to save it, or whether it's it's just once you make one choice it's kind of going down that route um but i did choose one of one or the other and now i have to deal with the consequences i don't know how it would have been if i'd have gone the other route but i think that's nice there's a lot of replayability there not that you really need it because it's such an immensely epic game anyway mm -hmm. uh 
The skill mechanics can be a bit annoying, like there's no context sensitivity, so it won't pick the best person for the job, even though I only have one person in my party who can actually open locks. Uh... It, it's like you have to select the right person for the task and then select their skill. and Yeah, it's a bit annoying. But other than that, I don't think anything stands out about the mechanics as being particularly unique. It just seems to be a kind of sprawling, epic adventure that I'll... I'll be lost in all over the Christmas period, so that's cool. So did you move on from um, Divinity, or since they're kind of similar games, are you going to try to play both? Or? I, I'm, I'm going to try and do both over Christmas. I didn't move on, it's just that mm, I saw this was on the sale, and, and I guess I, I like it thematically better than Divinity. Because it's like Fallout, and not, yeah. not Fantasy World and stuff? Yeah, I mean, I, I like Fantasy, but I like Fallout more. <laughs> Makes sense. Yeah. It, it looks really cool watching this video over here. It looks like it does. People have slated the graphics, but like this is this is. But that's what it's supposed to be out. like. Yeah, this is what it's about. This is about as good as it's gonna get for what it is. And I think it, it looks pretty damn good. No, I've heard that there's like tons of tons of text and there's no voice acting, so you're reading a lot of written NPC text. Is that true? There's a lot of text. It's probably a couple of novels worth in there if you bother to read it all. Okay. <laughs> That's like one of the, one of the reasons I know I struggled to get into Dragon Age Origins was just because the protagonist wasn't voiced. You know, it's hard to imagine like the yeah. amount of text that's in in Wasteland with uh, with no. I mean, there's there's ever. voice acting here and there for cutscenes and that, but it's not not a huge amount. Is it, is it well written at least? I think so. Okay. Not I mean, just I'm not like really a writer, so sci-fi. I can't. <laughs> uh... It's 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 not great, but it's it's all right. It's okay. good. I mean, it's easy to skip as well, though. You don't have to read everything. You can just click all the buttons, and it highlights the keywords, so you kind of know where the conversation's going. It's not like you choose from. You have to you read all your responses, and then pick uh, one. It's like it'll pick out keywords from what they've said, and then you get to follow up on one of them. Which okay, is fun. So there's there's enough going on to propel you forward if if you're not reading every, you know, ounce of dialogue. Yes. Okay. Sounds pretty good. I may I may have to check this one out. I like these kind of It is good. It wasn't games. a huge discount. I think it was like 30 quid down to 20 quid. Well, it's not that old, so it makes sense that it would still be kind yeah. of um Yeah, I hear it was a Kickstarter. It was. Yeah. Pretty much yeah, any yeah. game that's not like your standard game was kickstarted. <laughs> If it's not like your standard AAA shooter, it's probably like game. it was. I mean, like not like your standard, like oh, this is a third-person, first-person shooter. You know, they're they're all kickstarted. It seems like this. That's the only way to get a game that's not like Ubisoft the game. This, you're not gonna see Wasteland Two on the shelf of like Target or Walmart, is what you're saying. Yeah, really? prob- that's pretty sad. But then again, well, to be fair though, what PC games do you see on the shelf at Target or Walmart? I mean. Yeah, things made by Blizzard and like hidden object mystery games. Yeah, I I I <laughs> I have zero interest in buying a disc. Actually, I just uh I just bought a solid state drive for my computer the other day and realized that I only had nice. one SATA cable in my computer, so or two SATA cables, <laughs> one that's being used for my current HDD. So I no longer have an optical drive because. I was like, well, solid state drive is more important than optical drive, so I disconnected the SATA cable from my optical drive. So even if I'm I wanted to install it, this. <laughs> well, this computer's a couple years old, so it's still, you know, they were still making them at that point when, uh, when, it, when I got this thing. But yeah, so I couldn't yeah. install a disk-based game if I wanted to. Man, the frustration when a bit of hardware comes with a CD to install it and not an online one. It's like, oh, what yep. bloody oh, yeah. year is it? My my new graphics Especially. card just came with one, and I, I had to go and download the drivers because, as I said right before that, I installed the SSD. So it's like, come well, on, Nvidia. Me off of those little tiny CDs that don't fit into a slot loading drive. Like, oh God, yeah, yeah. Damn it. Little mini discs. Yeah. Who who invented those? I'd like to smack them. Well, we should just we should find out and call them and complain. We so, so Rob, did did the crew come on a mini disc? Because I heard that game's pretty small. Uh, <laughs> wow, man, you just like you just firing the trolls on all eight cylinders today. Hey, uh, I'm I'm a V12 son. That's that's not even a thing in that game. 
You're not a thing. <laughs> Uh, the crew, uh, the crew did not come on a mini disc because I purchased it digitally. I purchased it digitally so that it would be on my hard drive at all times because it is a massively multiplayer online game. Um, so I, uh, I, I blasted through to level fifty, uh, which is the level cap in that game, and so now I'm like doing the end game stuff. I have not completed the story yet, um, but you don't, you don't have to just to hit the level cap. I'm kind of catching up with the story now. Um, the crew. So, if you listen to the last week's podcast, my reflections on the crew were were really positive. And a week later, my reflections on the crew remain really positive. Um, but there are definitely a few things that it's done wrong. Um, for starters, it is kind of it would have really helped if this game just straight out the gate was like, by the way, drive the car with these different steering settings and then pick the one you like because there is so much complaint about the handling on the internet and so much about that is tweakable. Um, I actually, I went to the Steam forums and found a post by an Ubisoft developer uh, that said, hey, if you want this to handle more arcadey, turn, uh, what was it, steering stability, I think it was like steering stability up to 80% and steering linearity up to 80%. And suddenly it's like a whole new video game. Like, the, the handling is dramatically improved. Um, I've had it on the sport handling uh, preset as far as assists go. Um, but that, that's helped a lot. So the steering is very tweakable. You can go into the options to mess with it. But because it's kind of hidden away and the game never tells you about it, a lot of people are having a subpar experience because they're just going on, uh, going on in. And the preset is all driving assists on, which means the game will act to keep you from drifting. And, you know kids like the drifting um so that's that's one of the kind of things that's holding it back a little bit people need to get into those options and tweak those um another thing that's holding it back is that there is more to do in the game than it appears even if you just open up all of the points on the map where events go um but unfortunately this other stuff to do they've put very incidental rewards in for like not it's basically it's earning license plates you know, you can earn license plates from all 50 states and then several from different countries like Japan, Sweden, Great Britain, etc. Do, do you guys still say Great Britain over there? Is that... No. <laughs> no? Okay, England. I'm That's sorry. That's not a England. thing anymore. Okay. <laughs> um, but yeah, you can you can earn license plates by doing these complicated tests. Uh, they're, in your, they're in your menu. If you go to the map screen and I'm on a controller so you click in the left stick and then go to awards they're like buried in there but um, there's some really fun challenges in there stuff like recreating movie chase scenes or you know just like kind of longevity challenges very much like World of Warcraft style achievements um, where you just you, you kind of do really interesting feats or just you know have drifted 15 miles in your lifetime or whatever um, and that kind of stuff uh, you know there's more stuff to do there and there's a lot of interesting stuff to do there but it's buried there's nothing pointing you toward it um, but I'm still really positive on the game. Um, I, I think it's going to improve as more and more people reach the level cap, and then we've all got cars balanced against each other um, for the PvP, which is the end game for it, basically. Um, the kind of epic gear in the game, platinum parts, are a little too easy to earn. Um, once you hit level 50, you can start getting those platinum parts by doing any skill challenge in the game. So the quickest way to grind platinum parts is if you're in a street performance or circuit car, just do jumps over and over again. Find jump events that give you the parts you want. And if you're in a dirt or a uh, raid car, just do hill climbs over and over again. And, you know, I wish I could say that there was enough incentive to do, like, a greater variety of missions just to get your initial platinum gear, but there's not. And jumps and hill climbs go so quickly if you use the right cars for them that, you know, the... The first thing you're going to do when you hit level 50 is just jump and hill climb your way to a set of platinum gear so that you can compete in PvP well. Um, so I'm, I'm really hoping that the PvP takes off. Um, another little hiccup they have. Like, it's all... It's a bunch of tiny little things that add up. I still love the game, and I still emphatically recommend it, but it's got all these tiny little things that add up. Another one being um, there's five different PvP lobbies, and so it can take a while to find a match and you gotta say well should I just like sit here you know this clock's been ticking should I wait for more players to come to the Midwest lobby or should I go to the mountain you know mountain zone lobby 
Um, so there's, there's, they really need to drop an incentive on like, you know, one and a half times bucks XP reputation if you go to the mountain lobby right now or something. Um, just to make sure everyone's gravitating toward the same spot because, um, you know, only a certain portion of the people are at level 50 and driving, uh, you know, 1,100 point, 1,200 point cars. So um, I guess any, any particular questions about the crew? Do you think you'll be playing this in like a month from now? Yes, uh, assuming the PvP takes off. That's, that's really the critical thing because the end game in this is so much about um, both personal PvP and faction PvP. Um, you can join one of five different factions within the five tens, which is the street racing gang, and you earn points, you earn reputation for your faction by doing PvP or these uh, real long endurance race events that can take like up to multiple hours to finish. Um, so whether or not the PvP takes off is going to be a big question. Um, it, but if it does, I could see myself absolutely. I could see this taking up the same spot in my like gaming pattern as like a like a Call of Duty multiplayer where I just like sit down and I just like, you know, blast it out for an hour or so a night just to enjoy some fun competition. And uh, certainly the reputation system, you know, ought to give it some uh, some more competition about it. You know, like you're not just working for yourself, you're working for your faction. I'm going to sound clueless here, but is there any shooting in this at all? Or is it literally just driving? Like when you say PvP, do you just mean racing other people? Racing other people, yes. Um, but there's it is literally like, just a racing game. It is a it is a all manner of driving game. So um, there are <laughs> missions where there will be like stacks of drug crates scattered around a huge expanse, and you have to like run those down. There will be missions where you have to uh, go off. You know, you have to go like to completely trackless. You know, off road territory, and you need to bring your raid car for that, or you'll slide all over the place. You can do city races with lots of 90 degree turns at city blocks. You can do uh, circuit races on like, you know, professional racetracks and stuff. The huge variety- and There's no drive by shooting or anything. No, no, no. You never exit your car except for cutscenes. Ha. Huh. Yeah, but it's- I, a, I'm a, there's lots they just of... built a whole game around driving. Like, and not even just as a driving game, but tried to fit right. all this other weird stuff in there. That's so weird. Well, it's, it's kind of nuts, but there's enough variety in, like, the types and styles of driving you do that, and also enough difference in, like, the time investment you can put in. You know, those skill challenges, like I was talking about, jumps and hill climbs, and that's only a small portion of the total skill challenges, um, those, those are, like, 30-second to 60-second investments. And then there are different types of events that go all the way out to that two-and-a-half-hour mark, where it's, like... You're doing like a lap around the outskirts of the United States or something at that point. Um, so there's there's tons to do for every level of time investment, and uh, and like I said, I, the the critical thing about the crew is going to be does the PvP take off? Do people keep queuing for it and playing it? Because um, if it does, I could really see that being a lot of fun. So mm. is this your game of the year, Rob? Is it? Are both putting you on the spot here? Is this Rob's game of the year of 2014? It is not my game of the year, but it's on the list. It's definitely. I'm having a lot of fun with it. Like I would say, well in the top five. Well in the top five. Yeah. So we have some some comments in the chat here. Um, Dither Win says uh, so. It's basically Driver Online. <laughs> and I guess There's more variety because driver driver never really took you off road. I don't think in a meaningful way. Like driver just had you going around the city. the The amount of map you have to cover when you drive in the crew is kind of nuts. So it's real, like the game has a really permissive fast travel system. If you've driven to any any inch of the map you've driven to before, you can fast travel back to for absolutely no penalty for free, um, as long as you're not in the midst of an event. So. So it's you're not cool talking because... like little little hot spots on the map, like literally just you could be like, I want to go to the middle of this field, and it would yes. just drop you in the middle of that field. You could drop your car right in the middle of that field if you'd been within like half a mile of it before, hmm. um, which is super cool. Yeah, and and then if you know, so you can get wanderlust, and you can be like, man, I just want to like road trip and just like see where this road takes me, explore a new chunk of the map, and then you know, next thing you know, if you were like, man, let's let's grind for some parts, let's do some skill challenges, you can literally open the map and any you know if you've discovered all the satellite dishes that reveal all of the mission sites 
you can literally just port to any skill challenge on the map and do it uh, or any mission you've done before and do it again and um, there's another thing that's kind of that's kind of I think confusing about the game for a lot of people is that you can get first place in events and receive a bronze medal because the medals are awarded on the basis of how well you did independent of the other racers like getting first place in a lot of races that are missions is the bare minimum for passing the mission but then how much better you did than those other drivers or how much actually how much better you did than like static time records um really determines which medals you get which determines which parts you get and parts are the equivalent to mmorpg gear um so it's it's a it's a very confusing thing to like come in first place and see a bronze medal drop on you um, and, and to get those platinum medals, you're going to need a high-end car with like 1,100, 1,200 points a gear. Um, but it's, it's, you know, it's doable once you do, and I think those steering tweaks that the, the Ubisoft dev posted in the Steam forums um, have, re like, I, suddenly, it's, you know, suddenly my car is like acting as responsively as I want it. So uh, it's a shame that stuff's buried and that a lot of people might not give the game a chance before they discover that. Hmm. It's still on my list of things that I want to check out, but it's not at the top of that list. So, but then again, I yeah, guess yeah, I, I, it's an internet game. So if I don't check it out soon, I feel like maybe I miss out on the internetness. Right. There's, you know, even if it's still running six to twelve months down the road, you know, just the the nature of, you know, I mean, on PC it might have more longevity just because PC gamers tend to hang on to things for longer. But on consoles, you know, there might be people who drift away from it over time, so we'll just have to see. This actually um, seems like a good game to put my, my new graphics card to work, though, so maybe I should maybe I should pick it up just so I can kind of be like, look at all the pretty cars on my new card. Oh, yeah, it's so pretty. Well, the game's not the game's not even a graphics powerhouse, but that's, that's a trade-off they make so that when you fast travel, the game loads super quickly. Mm. Um, if you so you can like I said you can fast travel to anywhere on the map. If you actually on the controller you hit the right trigger like one or two times to zoom in, the game actually loads way faster uh, if you do that than if you try to fast travel to a place just from looking at the full zoomed out map. Because as you zoom in, it's selecting the assets of the general vicinity that you've zoomed into and starts preloading them in the background. Um, so if you think if you think to zoom in every time before you fast travel. The fast travel becomes almost instantaneous. You just have to zoom down like once or twice so that the game knows, okay, we're in mountain territory. Load the mountain assets, and then uh, and then we can get the sky on the road. Um, so it's it's very instant gratification in that regard. But the trade-off is the graphics assets aren't super detailed. And I've seen people. I don't find it something that's bad enough to complain about. I think the game looks plenty attractive. The draw distance is nice. There's a little bit of pop in if you get to, if you get to a place where there's something real far off in the distance, but it's certainly you know it's it's certainly attractive enough, and I'm enjoying it. And on PS4, it's a it's a solid 30 frames per second. All right, so there you go. There's the crew. There's your weekly crew update. I'm sure yeah. we will hear more about the crew as will. as will, time will goes on. Next week. So. Uh, in keeping with the apparent tradition, the only new thing that I've played is an iPhone game because for some reason, apparently, I am just Mr. iPhone Game Man. I don't know how. Mobile, huh? Yeah, I don't know how this happened or where I came Speaking from. Speaking some real shit games, aren't you, Dave? I guess Good I don't. Casual. I don't really know what's going on WWE here. WWE superstars. I mean, wow, hey, I hey, told you that was super. A piece of shit. Super card, get it right, James. Get it yeah, right. Yeah, whatever. We we reviewed that on iPadBoardGames.org. Oh, nice plug. I still play it, by the way. <laughs> Super card. I actually was just playing Super card before we started, but that's not the game we're gonna talk about. No, no, no. We're gonna talk about a game that that doesn't suck, at least in theory, and that is <laughs> Peggle Blast. Uh, did you guys oh. play Peggle back in the Peggle days of Peggle play Awesome? A Peggle. So, Peggle Blast is basically uh, best described as Peggle Crush Saga. Uh, I hate this already. Yeah, I, I theoretically hate it, but at the same time, it's still Peggle. So it's free to start with, as you would expect from the Peggle Crush Saga. And 
it has, you can actually see perfect timing. You can see it on the screen. The, 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 the video just showed it for a second. And you beat levels and you move through the map. And then when you beat a zone, you have to get three of your friends to help you unlock the next zone. Just like uh, just like Candy Crush Saga. So. Oh my god. Yeah, so that, that kind of sucks. But um, it does add some new gameplay mechanics to Peggle. Like, uh, it actually, you just saw it on this. You're seeing it right now. There's these big eggs. And in, so instead of having to clear all the orange pegs, you got to hit the big egg a few times to break it. And then a phoenix flies out of it, and you have to do that three times on the level to move on. So it does make some changes to the Peggle formula. And in spite of my deep-seated hatred for free-to-play games, unfortunately, I think I'm going to have to keep playing this just because I really like the core, simple gameplay of Peggle. And so you're telling me that graphical pachinko has never been better? Uh, no, no, I'm certainly not telling you that. I mean, it was better when I paid $2 and just got all of Peggle. Um, <laughs> but at the same time, this is more Peggle. And if it follows the same thing as Candy Crush, which is basically like unlimited levels, um, as long as you get your stupid friends to unlock them for you, then, I mean, that's pretty good. Like, unlimited Peggle? Like, a world with unlimited Peggle is like a world that I want to live in because, like, it's Peggle. You're an idiot. So the other thing, too, that's new is when you get the extreme fever, when you beat the level, however many uh -huh. balls you have left, instead of getting bonus points for those balls, they all shoot out and just go crazy. So mm -hmm. if you have nine balls left, it shoots all nine balls, and then you get a lot of points and things like that. There's things with uh, you get you have to hit keys of the right color to unlock an area, and then that will allow you access to the pegs in that area. So definitely make some tweaks to the gameplay mechanics of Peggle. And I like it. And it's free. Other than, so other than the Candy Crush bullshit, if you like Peggle, what the hell? You might as well play it, you know? Every, every time I look at Peggle, all I can think is, like, this is the video game made for the everyone gets a trophy generation. Like, <laughs> extreme fever at all times, fireworks and rainbows. Oh, you were the best. This unicorn is smiling at you. Look at him. He's smiling right now if you're watching this stream. He's, a ha he's got freaking rainbow glasses on. It's, he was so proud of you. you. You hit one button and then watched a whole bunch of things tell you you got points. It's, it's really, it's, it's really is a great mobile game. I remember when Peggle first came out, and there was a lot of hype around it when it was a PC game. And I was like, I don't see how this is fun because it's so simple and kind of mindless. And on a PC, it is stupid and simple and mindless. But on a phone, it works fine because in a, uh, it's the same reason you play WWE Supercard because it's just stupid. It's a thing to do. It's yeah, it's stupid. There are no time good killer. mobile games. You are incorrect. There, there are. I agree. There are no good mobile games relative to real games. So you have to put them in their own shitty category of shittiness. I think we should ban mobile games from this podcast right now. Otherwise, I, we set a dangerous precedent. I like dangerous precedents. They're the best kind of precedents. I am the You're a bad man. I am the president of the United States of Technophilia <laughs> Podcast, and I vote fuck you, James. We're talking about mobile games. If we're not careful, people may start respecting this as a legitimate gaming genre, and that just can't be. That can't be. Well, not if we start talking about mobile bloody games, they won't. Well, speaking of uh, putting and things to bed, I just want to put some rumors, some very nasty allegations that are going around from angry logic uh uk uh claiming that my wow character is a smurf and this is just unacceptable he is a gnome he may be short <laughs> but he is not blue and so when he came in i was streaming wow like a week ago and he came into the chat room and he's like is your character a smurf and when he said a smurf i initially thought uh, like the gaming term Smurf, meaning Slay. like my, yeah, my yeah. alternate account or whatever. So I was what? like, what, what does a Smurf mean? It's like your like your low your account that like you your low level account that you go in and like play on to like I guess to kind of troll people. Well, yeah. So <laughs> if you're if you're a really good player at some something, your Smurf account is the account you use to get match made with. But like you literally. You log into this account, you fail a bunch of times to get into a really bad matchmaking pool, and then you use it to experiment with slash harass with people who don't know what you're doing. You know, like they that you are such a master of this that you can mess with you can mess with poor innocent people. 
Like Dota pros will do that. They'll make a, a Smurf account, a second Steam account to go play Dota with in low matchmaker ratings so they can but show people. But surely their character wouldn't be like tricked out, so they'd basically be shit. Yeah, but that doesn't matter in Dota. Dota's just based on your skill. So if... Oh, um, it's based on your skill. Yeah, it's okay. So if you're better than them, it doesn't matter. If you just go in there and you purposely lose a bunch of games to get your matchmaking rating lowered, you would just go in there and crush them. There's no... There's no items in Dota that make you better. You know what I mean? It's just, are you better it's than them or not? Acquired in, it's all acquired match by match yeah. every time you play. Yeah, exactly. So, um, anyway, yeah. So, he asked that, and I, I, I was like, no, no, this is my main, blah, blah, blah. And then I realized um, he meant, literally, is my character a smurf? Like, a blue little midget guy. And uh, I was like, then I got, then then I started arguing with him that it was a, a a a gnome, and we went back and forth on that for a while. So, I want to put this rumor to bed. He's a gnome. Stop it, Angry Logic. Not a Smurf. Uh, Rob, what other dumb games you got to tell us about this week? <laughs> this is this is what it's become. I'm just the filler, huh? This is it. <laughs> well, uh. I mean, your second game on this list is Pokemon Art Academy, so I'd say that qualifies as dumb game. All right, yeah. so hold on. <laughs> There's – okay, let me back up. <laughs> All right, back up. I have for the longest time had only a 2-gigabyte memory card in my 3DS, and I rectified that problem getting a 16-gig card, and I was like, I should get a thing to put on this because now I can buy games without checking how many blocks they are. And um, so I, I was looking in the eShop, and I was like, you know, I've always wanted to learn to draw better. And, uh, and you know, I don't want to, like, take a professional class or something that I have to attend all the time. I just want to, like, get something uh, that will help me do that. And, like, cartooning specifically, you know, that would be a, be a fun thing to do. Like, people make web comics. It's, it's a thing that's done on the Internet. Um, so I picked up Pokemon Art Academy kind of on a whim. And uh, sure, sure enough, like, I am, I am slowly but surely getting better at, like, cartooning uh, because of it. It's, it's basically a progression of drawings, like the first things they have you do are little more than trace the Pokemon, good job, you know, like it's it's very much aimed at like, it is aimed at children, make no mistake. Um, but but anyone can kind of, can, can benefit from the lessons there. They start you out with tracing and they start you out with like tracing from perspectives. Um, but I've moved up to the point now where it just gives me basic geometric shapes on the screen and it's like, okay, this is these are the basic shapes of the Pokemon. Draw the details around these shapes, and so it as it takes off more and more of the training wheels. You know, I'm finding like an actual skill developing where my lines are straighter than before. My uh, my attention to detail is better. Where I'll I'll notice you know the first things I drew were um, were real you know kind of lousy and thrown together, but then then I start to notice like little places where like, oh, okay, you know, things are a little crooked or I could shade better here or this, that, or the other. Um, so it's it's definitely a slow progression as it starts. Um, it, it puts a lot of lessons in your way before you get to the stuff where the training wheels are off. Um, but now that I'm there, you know, I'm enjoying sitting down every day for about an hour and just drawing on my 3DS. The tool suite is totally, you know, professional and big and there's there's lots of different like there's pastels, there's markers, there's paintbrushes, there's outlining pens, um, there's layer controls so that you can do outlines on one layer and then paint on them without overlapping them. Um, so it's certainly a full featured art kit, and there is a there is a game called New Art Academy that's for 3DS that is just general like learning to paint and stuff with like still lifes and and portraits and things like that. Um, but having this one be Pokemon themed, you know, it it gave it an accessible theme. I'm a Pokemon fan, and um, it it definitely leans more toward the cartoonish kind of stuff. Um, and I had a lot of fun with it. You know, I'm uh, it's it's got kind of a quirky sense of humor, and it's it's it first spins a lesson to instruct you on a style, and then it has a few more lessons where it's like, okay, apply what you learned to this, and try to try to make it you know yourself without much instruction. Um, so it's it's pretty cool. Uh, I mean, if if you want to learn to draw on your 3DS, I can definitely recommend it because it it will teach you transferable skills. And uh, I'm looking forward. Yeah, I started on December 2nd, so I think 30 day. You know, I'm gonna do like a 30 day thing where uh, I look at what my art looks like the day after New Year's, 
and uh, and see. It sounds you know, like it would have been a good article, it. and you're too late now, though, aren't you? Why? <laughs> I don't know. Have you been taking pictures? No, you save. You can save all your pictures. You all can right. save your work as you go. Yeah. Well, I so, want you. I want you to write an article about your 30-day Pokemon. I want to. Oh, I became an artist. All right. Yeah. Well, I I approve of your article right now, live yes. on this podcast. You don't have to pitch it to me. I approve it. So there you go. Nice. That's yeah. how our editorial <laughs> process works. So Mark Fusion wants to know: Do you guys play any non asterisk 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 games? So I assume that means shit. Uh. So, well, I guess he's talking to you two there because I clearly do. I know that I know for a fact that the next game that uh, Rob is going to talk about is not shit, and that game is known as The Crew. No, just kidding. It's <laughs> Civilization <laughs> Beyond Earth, and a new patch for it. Yeah, if I'm yeah. correct. Um, well, I mean, uh, Civ, Civ Beyond Earth has gotten a little mixed reception too uh, because of its its. God damn it, you know, Rob! I told you but... not shit. <laughs> <laughs> well, the, okay. People really dig Civilization V, but that's after two expansions, extensive patching, um, so on and so forth. Like it is, it's a game that has been refined over years at this point. Um, and Civ Beyond Earth is going to have to go through that same process before it gets, you know, as good or nearly as good as Civ V. Uh, but this this big patch that they just put out, uh, Frax just put out a big patch for Beyond Earth um, that has tweaked a lot of the uh, a lot of the presets and, and values and things like that um, to get rid of basically the most exploitable victories by people. You know, like it was the the fact of the matter is when, you, when you're working with a game like Civ Beyond Earth that has a radial tech tree where you don't even have to explore certain parts as opposed to the linear branching tech tree of Civ 5, you've got, you know, a myriad of additional game states that you have to account for if people beeline their way to certain technologies, because you've got so many more spokes of haves and have-nots that people could be experiencing. Um, so it's going to be a tough game to balance, but they've gone through, uh, they've nixed some of the you know more exploitable stuff. Uh, one of the big complaints was you get way too many trade routes, and you have to micromanage them too much, so they have taken away one of the ways to get a bonus trade route, so that cuts down um, the number of trade routes you have to manage by a third. They've added a button that just says repeat previous trade route when a trade route uh, expires. Um, two of the mechanics that were really exploitable uh, were health and what was the other one? With health, the problem was you could either either you were playing, like health was a very much all or nothing thing. If you went through the um, the prosperity tree of the, of the culture stuff, you would get like so much health that you could literally expand anywhere you wanted with your cities and never, you know, never be running a health deficit uh, for your, for your total, uh, your total nation. Um, but if you, if you didn't do prosperity, you were just constantly, you know, suffering penalties because you had more people than you could serve. Um, the other, oh, another thing that was really, was really exploitable was uh, just racing for high-end military technologies that people would uh, race up the military tech tree and then suddenly anyone else who wasn't playing the military game would be so utterly outclassed that you know the guy who had raced up the military tech tree could take down like four units for every one high-end military unit he threw at the uh, uh, at the fight so they've dialed back some of those unit power levels they've made it uh, a little slower to accumulate affinity which is what gets you uh, gets you your military boosts so basically, I guess the bottom line is I'm looking forward to jumping back in the game again because this is the first major balance pass on the game uh, post-release, and um, certainly Fraxis has proven that if you give them, if you give them a few years, they'll get there. You know, um, like I said, Civ Five, Civ Five was kind of panned when it came out too. People said, you know, this was a lost cause. We're going back to Civ Four, etc. And now you've got Civ Five pulling in fifty thousand, you know, concurrent players per day on Steam. You can check the stats. It's one of the highest played games on Steam even this long after its release. But everyone's playing with Gods of the Kings and Brave New World. Is uh, that patch out for Endless Legend yet? Uh, I, I mean, they've done several several small patches for Endless Legend. Um, but there's still... I thought, there's, I thought you said there was a big patch coming up or something. Yeah, they're working on a major AI overhaul. Um, yeah. That is not done yet. Yeah, they're still they're still working on that because they're trying to they're 
man, that video was so cool where they talked about how the AI is a series of agents all with different priorities and they all throw their priorities on the chalkboard and then they are ordered and that's how the AI decides like what to do. Um, but yeah, that, that patch is still a work in progress on their end and they said that might, you know, it's so extensive that it might be like February or March 2015. Bloody um, hell. Someone yeah, in the chat yeah. room says, is it worth getting before the next expansion or should I go with Endless Legend for Christmas? That was day day Thurwin. Yeah, day that, That's uh, that's Dave for short, right? I believe your real name is Dave because you're one of the, you're one of the people who visits my Twitch channel. Uh, Dave, um, if if you were to get one or the other before Christmas, as far as things to play immediately in their current get state, Endless Legend. get Endless Legend. Yeah, one hundred percent. Get Endless Legend right now. Uh, Civ Beyond Worth, Civ Beyond Earth needs more work to become a great game. Then Endless Legend needs to become a great game. Like they're both, they're both suffering a little bit from AI-related problems, but uh, Endless Legend is better right now immediately. Um, but I'm looking forward to seeing what Firaxis does. They've got some brilliant game designers uh, on their team, and uh, and certainly if you know it's it's uh, if it's just a sci-fi Civ Five at the end of the day that is as good as Civ Five is now, uh, someday Civ Beyond Earth will be incredible. So. Um, but I, I need to. I have not actually played with New Balance Pass yet, so that's going to be a thing I try sometime this week. I don't know if I'll stream it, but uh, it might be. Uh, it's something I really want to dig into and see what they've done to the game. Boom shakalaka, Civ Beyonder. Back to you, Dave. All right, so it is time to move on to the news part of the show because we've talked about all the stuff that we've played, and well, now we're going to talk what? No more shit games. No more shitty games, except unless uh, unless you consider games on PlayStation to be shit. Do you consider games oh, on PlayStation yes. to be shit? Let's talk about that later. Well, or are we talking about it now? Okay. We're going to talk about the PlayStation experience now. Now back to Dave LeClaire with the Peggle Minute. Yes. Um, <laughs> so first, before we talk about the games at the PlayStation experience, I just want to say that I tried to buy that stupid um, 12,000 limited edition 20th anniversary PlayStation 4 for $500. Oh, and I got one in my cart and then spent an hour and 45 minutes trying to check out only to have it keep erroring out and erroring out and then eventually saying uh, sorry, this product is no longer available. So, And I, ah. I looked on Twitter and everybody was bitching and having the same problems. So it sounds like um, it sounds like Sony was not prepared for the demand, which makes no sense because if you put out something that is only 12,000 of it, you know there's going to be high demand, and yeah. they, they fucked it up bad, so good on you, it's Sony. It's eBay fodder at a certain point. Yeah, I looked on, um, I looked on eBay, and uh, man, that was, uh, yeah, they're selling on eBay for a lot. Uh, Fun is dead, Dave. Apparent. Fun is dead because eBay exists and anyone can do it. Yes, apparently. Um, there was um, – they're selling on eBay for over $1,000. So, <laughs> yeah. There's one currently on there for 920 with 26 bids, and it still has five days left. Um, the other day I looked, there was one that had like three minutes left and had like 100 bids at $1,800. Oh. So – and I wanted to buy one to actually own one. Right. So, screw you people. Yeah, anyway. No, limited editions don't work with the technology that we have today because all that happens is people who want to sell them go after them. Yeah, exactly. Not the people who want to actually own the cool, rare thing. Um, so, the, I think the biggest, the biggest piece of news that, come, that came out of the PlayStation experience was that uh, Street Fighter V is going to be a PS4 and PC exclusive. No Xbox for the next Street Fighter game. That seems wow, surprising to that. me. Yeah, I mean, I feel like, uh, you know, that's a, obviously a very certain audience is going to care about that. And from what I understand at, like, Evo and stuff, they already play Street Fighter. Is a, a PlayStation generally is, it's played on, so. Why? I guess it doesn't really matter. Like, you know, at the big competitions, the Street Fighter is usually played on PlayStation, not on Xbox anyway. So Is there a reason for that, though, or what? I think about, don't think, think about there's where a reason. Most, think about where most fighting games worth playing come from. Japan. Like, 
the yeah. Xbox One is not taking off over there. It's not worth the effort for the Japanese community. Well, I think in we, this I mean, case there it's um, there. well, there's your Mortal Kombat and stuff, but yeah, but I think in this case it's more just that Sony said, "Here, Capcom, here's some money. Don't make mm-hmm. this for Xbox One." And then Capcom uh, was like, "Okay." Most of the people play it on PlayStation anyway, so it doesn't really make a difference to us. We'll gladly take your money. Thanks, Sony. But it doesn't really look like there's any real big changes to the game from based on the um based on the video they show. It it kind of looks um you know, it's it's Street Fighter. It looks like Street Fighter 4 but new, I guess. I mean, that's really really all you could say about it is it's it's Street Fighter. But if you want more Street Fighter then Certainly nothing wrong with more, that's for sure. Yeah, they're going to have to do a lot more to tell us that that's more than a half step of the game. You know what I'm saying? Like, Yeah, especially because there's already been like 37 other Street Fighters. There's already been, you know, Street Fighter Mega Ultra Deuce Niner, Mega Chicken Cow Street Fighter Leet Sauce game version. So um, to all of a sudden slap the five on it, 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 that tells me that there needs to be some big gameplay shifts, but it doesn't look like there is. So I don't know what what is going to be significant with it not being a four expansion anymore and actually being five. But I guess we'll wait and see, right? Time will tell. So also uh, they showed new Uncharted stuff. Um, Nothing really huge there um, other than the fact that Nathan Drake looks a little bit older. And um, the other guy who's in every video game ever as a voice actor, Troy Baker, is in there as Nathan Drake's brother. So now they have Troy Baker and uh, what's uh, what's his name? Nathan Drake's name? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Nolan North. Nolan North in the same game. It's like a passing of the torch almost. Just singularity. <laughs> yeah, the, the gaming voice acting world is going to implode upon itself from the power of those two guys. I mean, they're both awesome voice actors. Don't get me wrong. I'm not insulting them. Uh, it's just and weird mo- that like they're... Troy yeah. Baker does some really incredible mocap. Yeah, I mean, The Last of Us was fantastic. So, you know, and, and mm-hmm. part of that is because of his performance as Joel. So, it, Ellie was a great character too, but Joel, I think, I think stole the show personally. But that's just that's just my opinion. Um, so as we, those are the biggest two. As we scroll down the list, is there anything that stands out to either of you as something that you feel that we should we should talk about? Those uh, are the biggest two. Those two shit titles. Seriously, I don't suppose anything else is going to be any better than that. Well, the two in terms of oh well, actually, I, I lied. The biggest news, in my opinion, is that Gang Beasts is coming to PlayStation Four. Oh dear. Gang Beasts oh. is amazing. So, Major League game. Baseball 15. Oh my god, it doesn't get better than that. Yeah, uh, that yeah. yeah. Also, uh The Forest is coming to PlayStation. The Forest, I have that on PC. I bought the early access on that and uh that's a weird game. Um it's very interesting. You walk Procedure around. It's like a horror. Yeah, it's like Minecraft with scariness. But well, uh build structures to survive. This sounds weird. It's literally it's Minecraft with scariness. Like and with good graphics. Uh, they're okay graphics. It's still alpha, so the graphics are not. I have actually not. pretty damn good. Well, this I is the PS4 version. The yeah. first-hand announcement, but I heard that uh, Bloodborne is getting randomly generated roguelike dungeons as one. Oh of the yeah, features. yeah, yeah. That's like a shooter, right? Basically, but with like random. What? Isn't blo- wait no, Bloodborne. Bloodborne is made by the guys who make uh, who make uh, the Souls games. Right, right, right. I'm thinking of uh, that other the other one that has born Battleborn from the peoples yeah so bloodborne is like it's like souls basically but new but more it's uh, what i've heard is it's going to be slightly more actiony and accessible um but the idea of there being i mean when they say and again i still haven't listened to the full announcement so i don't know if they elaborate on this better but when they say randomly generated roguelike dungeons i imagine like even you find a red potion. It does something different every time you, you know, restart the dungeons or whatever. Like, I hope that that's what they're doing because that could be a really interesting way to bring the roguelike to a more mainstream audience because the vast majority of roguelikes are made with, you know, low-end graphics and sound um, assets. You know, like, I mean, you got your FTLs, you got your Dungeons of Dreadmore, you've got, you know, uh, what's the other big one lately? Um, Crypt of the Necrodancer is kind of like is, is a roguelike as well Yeah. Um, but just the, the idea that we're taking this genre that's typically you know, small audience 
hardcore indie kind of games and we are sticking a mode in Bloodborne that lets you play like that, it can be really interesting to see uh, a bigger audience get to this because everyone has such high regard for the Souls games these days. The Souls games are quite beloved. James, I'm surprised you don't like those games. Do you not play well, Dark I'm Souls? I'm just glad I don't have a PlayStation right now. I mean, these are shit. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, James, what a jerk. <laughs> also, Rob broke the news order because technically that Bloodborne news came from the Game Awards, which was going to be the next Oh, sorry. I put Sony, yeah. the, the Sony data breach in there because it's well, either to be way, to you talking we were about gonna, PlayStation. I was going to bring Bloodborne up during the Game Awards, but I guess we brought it up now because Rob broke everything. No, I'm just kidding. God damn it, Rob. Um, <laughs> so, the, I mean, also, the, obviously, the one that people were talking about is they showed more No Man's Sky um, everybody's oh, yeah. excited for No Man's Sky, but until until they show what you actually do in No Man's Sky, it's kind of hard to be super. Ex- like I see, yes, you fly around and stuff, but like, what do you do? You fight? Like I don't. I I want to see. Like, I'm cautiously excited for No Man's Sky. Same here. Yeah. I don't want to go in and be like, this is gonna be the this is the game I've dreamed of for my whole life, but. If if everything they say is is what happens and they bring in some more than you know some actual fun gameplay to go along with all their traversal and flying around then it could be the best game ever but you know mm-hmm. every game be, could be the best game ever in theory there has to be some meaning to what you explore like if they do a good job of like adding meaning alongside those procedurally generated environments um and like you know certain destinations are more desirable for one reason or another that could be a super cool game that seems like a game that james would love when it comes out flying around from planet to planet in a spaceship nope really nope you don't like space games yeah but this is like like unlimited exploring for you to do okay hold on shouting i hate space games sounds like the most ignorant thing in the world because that's like just, irrespective of I, genre if we're in outer space it's it a is no-go irrespective for the only space game i ever enjoyed was privateer on the pc on um, that was ages ago and since then i just generally hate anything space genre what about mass star effect? trek star wars not a huge fan what about mass effect did you play mass effect oh i fucking hated that what is wrong with you? Fucking aliens, man. I hate aliens and space. It's just not a genre I like. It's just stupid. What about Civilization Beyond Earth? Well, I haven't played it, but... But you hate I it? I probably hate that, too, because I'm stodgy. Yeah, because <laughs> I, I... No, the reason I hate that, right? We talked about this before. I like Civilization because it uh-huh. has a grounding in reality. It's like getting a little mini history lesson on the, the whole of Civilization as time began, right? But Civ Beyond Earth... What's the fucking point? You're in space and you're making up all these technologies that have no grounding in anything in reality, and it's just stupid. Next, you're gonna you're gonna research plasma missiles and fuck knows what else. I hate you, James. So real quick. That's why I hate that kind of civic. So real stupid. quick, I'm not. We're not gonna get into the awards of the game awards because you can go back and watch the rebroadcast if you want to see it, and I don't want to like go and ruin it because. It's really not fun to hear us say, and the game of the year was blah, blah, blah. Like, they have an award show to make that all exciting. And at, from what I've heard, I haven't watched it yet, but I'm going to. I don't want to watch it. What was the game of the year? Nope. You're going to have to watch it. I'm not spoiling it's it for the view- I'm not spoiling it for the viewer. And also, I'm I... am going to look it up and spoil it for the viewers. Also, I have not seen it yet, so I don't want to spoil it for myself. Um, so we'll right, talk I'm about... Let's spoil it for you. So... Let's talk about the announcements of the, winner the game. Of the game awards Stop it, was... James. Don't be a douche. <laughs> Don't be a jerk. Our listeners don't want to know. So they, right. they, they well, did they, announce uh, some stuff at the Game Awards. So. Uh, I'm sure it's shit. It's always <laughs> shit. But um, so the people who made Gone Home, I'm sure James never played Gone Home. Rob, hey, did you play? Why are you skipping news? Don't skip news. You broke the order. Did you not notice the and Dude, we're at the start about of it? Sony and while you're yes, but we're also the... talking about game announcements, which makes more sense. To keep no, with the doesn't. game announcement. This is so much more important than no, your it's dumb not. little gaming news. No, it's not. It doesn't matter. Nobody cares about Sony being hacked. We'll get there later. Rob, did you play Gone Home? I did. And did you like Gone Home? It was cool. It's it's kind of a bait and switch, and I dare not say any more than that, lest I spoil it. But uh, it, certainly, it was an interesting story. 
I loved Gone. Through. I loved Gone Home. So. Mm -hmm. What happened once you got home? You got home, and then there was no one home, and then stuff happens. Um, <laughs> so they're working on a new game uh, called Tacoma. Have you checked that out at all? I haven't watched the video yet. No. So it looks. I guess it's it's gone home, like I guess, um, with more walking simulator. Well, it looks like there's a little bit more gameplay, and it looks very stylized, like Bioshocky. Mm. Um, it seems like it could be good. Uh, it's not coming until 2016, though, so we are a long ways away from that one. Um. Moving on to Nintendo, they announced that uh, Codename Steam will be coming in uh, March of 2015. That looks real cool. I'm, I'm excited about that one. I don't know much about that. What, what do you know about that? It's It looks kind of like a Advance Wars Valkyria Chronicles kind of thing. Like it's a, it's a you know, mid-1900s kind of war strategy game uh, with a steampunk aesthetic. Huh. Interesting. All right. Yeah. So is Codename Steam not a code name? Is that the name? I don't know if that's a working title or a project name or what. We'll have to wait and see. I really hope it comes out and it's Codename Steam. Like, that's just a, such a stupid name that it's awesome. That won't create confusion. What with a major, you know... Yeah, that's why it's awesome, though. Yeah, it's, you know, the, the, the one of the biggest gaming platforms. And then just have this game, Codename Steam. Uh, so the Banner Saga 2 is going to get a sequel. Uh, I'm sure it will be... Now, there's a game that James should like. It's a turn-based strategy game with a story. I have it. I, 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 I wasn't a huge fan of the, the, the thematic elements, the whole Viking stuff. It was... Uh... But the gameplay, at least, you like? It was a bit tedious after a while. I mean, the, the, the combat was all right, but... It felt more like rock, paper, scissors, and that's not a good mechanic as far as I'm concerned. What about you, Rob? Did you play the Banner Saga? I did not. No. I did not either, but it's on my Steam wish list when it's on sale to play it. Um, so a game that I loved uh, was Brothers A Tale of Two Sons. That's one of the only games to ever really make me... That and Gone Home, actually, are the only games that have ever really made me sad. Uh, I won't say why, but... Uh, so they're, the people who made that are getting a uh, starting a new studio called Hazelight Studios, and their first game will be published by EA. So EA's digging their heels into that indie stuff. Whew, there's a lot of stuff here, man. Uh, Godzilla game coming summer 2015 to PS3 and PS4 from Bandai Namco. I don't know if anybody really cares about a Godzilla game anymore, but it's Godzilla. Let's see, blah, blah, blah new game coming from his company Robert Bowling is starting a new company and they're releasing a game called Human Element not really much that's known about that uh, Nintendo announced that a Star Fox game for Wii U will be released before the Legend of Zelda Wii U which launches sometime in 2015 so a bunch of some things will happen before some other things will happen uh, they showed off some Witcher 3 which uh, has been delayed until May of 2015. It was supposed to come out... When was it supposed to come out originally? I don't know, man. I'm more excited about that cyberpunk game they're working on. That the CD Projekt Red is working on? Yeah, yeah. Have you ever seen the trailer for that? No, I've been pretty much focused on The Witcher 3. That what, what, is... what are you talking about? I wanna, I'd like cyberpunk. Uh, just look up CD Projekt Cyberpunk uh, trailer. C CD Project Cyberpunk. Cyberpunk 2077 is what the working uh, title, title is. I, I don't know if that's a full title or a working title or what it is, but there's no gameplay. It's, it's just a cinematic trailer. Um, but it's a it's a reworking of a uh, of an old tabletop RPG property uh, from like the 80s, I think. Um, but it's it's not like Shadowrun with like Cyberpunk and, man and Magic. It's a pure Cyberpunk setting. Hmm. Oh, I remember this trailer. Yeah, this sounded uh, pretty freaking awesome. Yeah, yeah, and I think it's in good hands with CD Projekt Red on it. It's true. C CD Projekt Dude, Red is awesome. Do you know anything awesome. about it yet? Or what? Just, nah. what's, just what's in that little cinematic trailer. That's pretty much it. Right. That's it. That's like best trailer of 2013. Wow. Well, it was they, so good. They also they have to focus their efforts on making sure that they get The Witcher done. Clearly, they're having a hard time finishing The Witcher since it's been delayed like three times now. Mm. But 
I would rather that than Fuck them. The no one cares about this. Let's 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 get this out the door. Come on. I would rather we'll have them it. delay games and make them good than do like than Ubisoft the game and just release it whether it's done or not. That's what we call an Ubisofting a game now. I've I've, I've decided this. Coined the term. Ubisofting all day long, son. I just Ubisoft all my games. Straight so, people. James, why don't yeah. you tell us about Sony getting hacked again? All day I, Sony gets hacked. Frankly, yo. I am shocked that any of you have, have not gone out immediately and sold your PlayStations for this absolutely f fail of a company, right? It's, it's the biggest data breach in history, again, from Sony. The last biggest one was also from Sony. And it's a group called Guardians of Peace. Uh, they inf infiltrated Sony's internal network and they stole 11 terabytes of data, including thousands of passwords that they found on a staff member's desktop in a directory called Passwords. Literally Excel files full of things like the, the password to the corporate UPS account, the, the private FTP servers, social media accounts, just all of them. It's completely shocking and it's become apparent that their internal password policy was non-existent, which is why so many employees had a password like 123. And normally I don't give a crap about data breaches. I mean, they end up being like, oh, they've got your email address or whatever, some more spam. Or even if they steal like your credit card info, like I really don't give a shit because at least here in England, you can't clone a credit card. You need to have the chip and the pin number. And then there's a number on the back that you need when doing shopping online and you're protected against fraud anyway, so like, who cares? But the breach that they've done here is so incredibly immense, it's crazy. I mean, we're talking about full salary details for like 10,000 company members. Their medical records, in one case there was like a mother's breastfeeding diet. People who were fired and the reasons for firing them, everything. It includes scripts for upcoming movies, unreleased movies. Annie, for instance, was leaked onto torrent sites and wasn't even out in the theaters yet. Like, ah. Did it wait? And so were user passwords released. put out or just employee stuff? We don't know yet. Um, f f what's been released so far is mostly employee stuff, but the group hasn't yet released all of it. And this is this is a continuing story, but. I mean, this started with uh, the Guardians of Peace threatening to release all of this if their demands weren't met, which it wasn't actually clear what their demands were or who this group was. But now it's become apparent that they demanded Sony cancel the release of an upcoming movie called Interview, which is like this comedy about assassinating Kim Jong What's his face And North Korea has denied responsibility for the hack, but who knows? Their email reads... Stop immediately showing the movie of terrorism, which can break the regional peace and cause the war. So I did hear about that, how they were pissed off about that movie because it's yeah. That movie looks yeah. pretty funny, actually, though. It does. I'm gonna it does. I'm gonna see that movie when it comes out, and I will break the international peace by watching it. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a big fan I, of the those two guys, so. Yeah. I honestly wouldn't be surprised if Sony completely gets destroyed by this hack. I mean. It's it's just so huge. Like, I mean, the stock price has already tanked, and most of Sony's money is actually made selling insurance in Japan. And I can't help thinking that a big part of their customer base will want nothing to do with such a complete fuck up. Um, I I would just strongly advise against getting a PS4 right now, or or be very worried about your PlayStation account. I'm glad I didn't. I'm glad I never got to the point in the online order process where I entered my credit card information. <laughs> Since the site was so fucking broken, I never actually got that far. I entered my address and then it died. So and one interesting thing that came out of this was the uh, the co-president of Columbia Pictures. There's like a male and a female co-president, and it turns out that the female co-president earns eight hundred thousand dollars less than her male counterpart. Even though they do exactly the same job. Well, has one, stuff has one been there longer, though? Maybe it's a matter of, you know, seniority. Yeah, maybe not. I don't want to immediately jump to the... Come. I don't want to immediately jump to the gender thing. For all we know, that guy could have been there 12 years longer than her, you know? So I don't want to... 
Uh, excuse me. Wow, that came out of nowhere. I don't want to uh, just automatically assume that it's a it's genderism, gender bias. Whatever. I like the ad. The only time I've ever had bullshit with something being hacked was on a PlayStation or my PlayStation Network account a couple of years ago, when um, someone hacked in and locked out my console, including all my digital content. And mm -hmm. yeah, and I couldn't reauthorize my my PlayStation for like six months. And even after phoning them, they basically called me a fucking liar. They were like, no, we think you went round to a friend's house and activated their console for your games. So I was like, no, I fucking didn't. I've changed the password. Dan's was like, I don't have any fucking friends, so there's no possible That's way that exactly could have happened. <laughs> <laughs> and then they, they just they kept calling me a liar. It was only after I wrote an article calling them bullshit that uh, they, they mysteriously contacted me out of the blue and reinstated my account. But... Uh, how I weird uh how weird would it be if Microsoft wins the console war based on Sony getting hacked and not actually based on like solid marketing or having the better console? They just win because Sony got hacked. Oh, I think gosh. that's a strong possibility at the moment. That would be so weird though. Like what a weird like imagine in like the, the annals of gaming history. It's like and here we have Nintendo completely shitting on Sega and just making a better... And then Sega releasing their console the day it's announced. And here we have Microsoft winning because Sony got hacked. James, I, I, think, you, like... I, I think you overestimate the average gamer's attention to the news cycle. I, I can't imagine this hurting their PlayStation business enough to make people It depends jump ship. what's not been released yet. It could be everyone's PlayStation Network account has also just been released into the public domain. I mean, but that's a possibility, right? But keep in mind, after the first huge data breach, they also did like a make right thing, and they offered a year of data protect protection on their own tab. Like they paid for, they paid for a year of like credit tracking and stuff for anyone who was affected. Um, you know, they've, they've done a lot of make good. That, but the the financial costs of this for them are going to be I immense. Absolutely, not only absolutely. In, this long term, in the long term as well, and I wouldn't, I wouldn't be surprised if their own employees were bringing like a class action lawsuit against them. Yeah, I'd be no, pretty I mad mean, if that information got out there about me. I'd be like, what the hell? You know, that's kind of annoying. I can't see, I can't see it falling apart on the basis of a consumer reaction. Now, if you want to tell me, you know, someone's going to collapse Soda, Sony with the data they stole, that's another slightly outlandish but slightly more. Uh, reasonable idea I guess <laughs> right now yeah that is very but no from a consumer point of view no I don't expect everyone to go and cancel their PlayStation accounts right now or anything but um yeah this is still terrible I mean this is the worst ever hack in history yeah yeah and it could it sounds like it could just get worse as as uh, time goes oh, on it will but you know what I think it's really good publicity for this upcoming movie <laughs> I mean, I think this movie was gonna do this movie was gonna do fine either way, but yeah. Yeah, maybe they'll make back all the financial butt hurt. That I, I see. On the movie <laughs> I see this movie as the the spiritual successor to Pineapple Express, and I loved Pineapple Express, so. Never heard of it. Huh. It's the these same two actors in like a a weed movie, you know, like a a, mar a stoner flick. James Franco and Seth Ro right Seth Rogen is that who it is? Yeah. 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 There, one is like a process server, and the other is like a weed salesman, and then hilarity ensues. <laughs> You're pretty standard weed comedy. So um, fun for the whole family. Yeah. So the last thing that I want to talk about this week, we'll end it on a, on a happy subject. Is uh, this is something that that would be right up James's alley because it involves a Kickstarter, but I don't think the actual uh, content of said Kickstarter is necessarily what James would be interested in. So what this is, is uh, it's a game on Kickstarter called Last Year. And it's basically like Friday the 13th, the video game. I know what you did last year. So um, it's kind of like that game uh, Evolve that's coming out. And uh, so what it is, is you have one person plays as like the Jason Voorhees serial killer. And five people play as the survivor at Silver Lake Camp. Hmm. It's left for dead without the zombies. Yeah, but it's but it yes, like that, but with one person. It's it's a a a, a wow. What's the word I'm looking for? Um, asymmetrical uh gameplay. Holy so God. one person is it's one on five, and obviously the monster is more powerful, but he has disadvantages and weaknesses. 
So it's just like Evolve in that regard, whereas, you know, in Evolve, you're a giant monster and you're fighting against the survivors, but it's more your traditional horror movie type setting and scene, which, uh, as someone who's a big fan of the old slasher type movies, this sounds like something that is totally up my alley. And I, I might even back their Kickstarter. I haven't decided yet. I've, I've never backed a game Kickstarter before, um, just because I, I prefer to wait till the game actually comes out. And this one's already been funded, so they don't need my backing to succeed. But man, this this has me super excited. So I just wanted to mention it real quick. Is it is it anyone we know, like people who are like we worked on X before? Uh, they posted what they've worked on. Yes, um, they have worked on. They are. Uh, they've worked on some Assassin's Creed games, which gives me a ton of confidence. <laughs> uh, Crisis, Far Cry, uh, Osiris, uh, some of the Hitman games. That new Hitman Go mobile game. They've worked on some of this. So. Okay. And James, there's Oculus support. Oh my God! But it's a horror game. I don't want horror on Oculus. Well, it's it's more like a. I mean, I guess it is a horror game, but it's not. It's more. Yeah, it's a horror game. Just dude. a combat game. So I know, I know there's a lot of people who would want to watch you play a horror game on Oculus Rift. <laughs> I would like to watch that. Yep, 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 yep. So I mean, this game could come out and be absolute garbage. You know, it's way too early to to say. But I'm gonna keep my eye on it because this game sounds like it would be something that I would really enjoy playing. The chance of me finding five friends to play with it is so exceedingly slim. <laughs> Yeah, well, I'm sure it'll have matchmaking that'll put you with randos. Yeah, but that always sucks. It's true. Randoms do suck. I hate random people. So They just fuck the game up, don't they, honestly? One thing I'm looking at that worries me already is that they're asking for an extremely low amount of money relative to the ambition of the project. Yep. Like, that's not... 63000 Canadian dollars is not video game making money. Um, and they don't and say they have team. other backers, you know. They don't say like, "Oh, but we only need this little bit." We have we have these people backing us to push us to the next level. So, mm-hmm. well, that's do, do a, they... he's probably gone with full time wage for one dude for a year. Maybe. Well, what? Yeah. How big does it say the team is? To say, uh, it's one guy, but he's worked on a number of AAA games before, and he needs resources to bring the rest of the team on board to make this game possible. Mm-hmm. I. Oof, and and that wasn't a name I recognize. Like I I always look when I'm back in Kickstarters. I'm like, does this person have social capital to burn if they fail? You know what I'm saying? Like, does this person have something to lose in the public eye? Like, do people know them? Yeah, that's um, that is definitely a little. It bit sounds concerning. achievable, but only at a very shallow level. Like, I don't think there will be that many different game modes. I think there'll be like one level or something. It'll be one single experience rather than a a fully fleshed out game. Also, match. I'm looking at his LinkedIn profile and like all of his experience is in audio. <laughs> He's an audio designer. Uh, <clears throat> so That's a bit, uh... I don't know. I I hope it comes to exist or if this doesn't somebody steals this idea and makes it because I want to play a game where I get to be like Michael Myers or Jason Voorhees and walk around trying to hunt other players. That sounds fun. So, we'll see. I just wanted to put it out there because I think it might be cool, but I don't know if you should back it or not. That's, uh... That's... Yeah, you know. That's, that's the for question. you to decide. Yeah. Well, and this is another thing that I think about when I look at something like this is, like you said, it's like Evolve. It's asymmetrical gameplay. One mighty thing against, you know, four or five weaker characters. I, I wonder when I look at this the same things I wonder when I look at MOBAs which is like how many of these can the market sustain like you've got the big dogs like League and Dota 2 and then you've got a whole bunch of people just picking at the scraps um, you, had, you had EA's Dawngate cancel which was supposed to be the huge twist on the mobile genre um, or on the, on the yeah on the MOBA genre and so like I wonder you know obviously there's a certain number of people dogpiling this game experience it'll be interesting to see like how many of these the market can sustain before we get to i mean you know same thing happened to minecraft you know how many games of harvest blocks to create items to harvest other blocks etc can the market sustain i love blocks you and many people apparently but 
it's just it's so weird to like see the pattern and be like well you know i guess i guess we're gonna see how thin we can stretch this from how many studios well this asymmetric team thing will be very difficult to pull off properly yes definitely the, the balance is is definitely a challenge um, apparently, we are very famous in Portugal, so... We're big in Portugal. That, I, think, I think big in Portugal needs to be this episode's title. I think that might be... I think we got our title, and uh, <laughs> I think we got our art. We'll just use a globe, and then we'll make Portugal like take up the whole globe. Like glow or something. <laughs> something like that. But there you go, so... Shout out to GGRCC901. What's up? What's yes, up, Portugal? and what's up to everybody else in the chat? Um, I still have yet to give away this copy of Retro City Rampage. I really want to give this fucking game away. So Fuck, just give it to me then. You know. I'm gonna just just tweet at Technophilia and say I love you, and I, and you'll be entered to win. That's all you gotta do. Just tweet at us and say I love you. It's and simple. This, uh, this competition is gonna end what, like, twenty four hours after the after the audio on demand goes up. When I, I whenever fucking somebody enters. <laughs> <laughs> You're just waiting to discard this game. The <laughs> last time I did this, Scudderman entered and said, "I'm entering, but I don't want the game." The fuck, Scudderman? Then why did you enter? <laughs> Stupid ass. Moral support. I'm giving you this fucking game, somebody. I don't even... I, someone's taking this damn game. Right, that's it. I'm going to go tweet you. You don't count. Oh, I don't, come on. I don't want to know about your damn Pizza Hut eating habits, James. Give me, give me the game, James. Give me the game. No. If I was going to give it Retro to one City. of us, I would take it myself. Retro City Rampage. We can't even give it away. That's I, the tagline. <laughs> I'm not going to do that. The developer of the game is very nice, oh, and I would not <laughs> insult him. I, I've played it too. It's it's solid. Yeah, you guys you guys actually should enter for it because it's a solid game. It's got a bunch of uh, funny old school gaming references in it. And this You'll is like the uh, this is the updated version of Retro City Rampage. So you get some new Ooh. stuff. DX, bruh. Um, so I think that's gonna do it for the show this week. Uh, I'd say that was a pretty mediocre show, like all of them. If you enjoyed our mediocre, our shut up, James. I'm trying to do my outro. God damn it! Now I lost my train of thought. If you enjoyed really for the stars here, Dave. <laughs> if you enjoyed our mediocre podcast, please leave us a above mediocre review on iTunes, meaning five stars. Uh, like us on Facebook at what the hell is our Facebook? Technophilia Podcast. Follow us on Twitter at the Technophilia. Subscribe or follow or what? No, you can't subscribe on Twitch because we're not partnered. You can subscribe on iTunes. Subscribe on iTunes, but you can't subscribe on Twitch because we're not partnered. You so follow on Twitch. follow on Twitch uh -huh. until we eventually get partnered. Then subscribe by giving us your money. Until um, we're rolling deep in all that podcast money. I'm surprised you didn't get offered a, a partner after that huge surge you had with the your your game there. Yeah, uh, takes more than a takes more than a single spike. I guess is the bottom line. God damn it. But don't they yeah. know who you are? I, I know. What with my 425 people showing up one time. That was pretty great. Yeah, you're like super famous, bro. Um, yeah. Did I forget anything? Personal Twitters? Si I'm Psydox. 425 at once? That's like more than we've ever had. I know. It was pretty crazy. Like views. Not it, just live <laughs> views. Views. It was that, is, that is my record now. That beat the 390 that I got playing Pokemon last year. Boom. Damn. Yeah. I think maybe Spikes. we should just start broadcasting the show on your Twitch channel. Yeah, screw this. <laughs> there we go. That might, it might not be a terrible <laughs> idea. Just just put it on your channel and call that, it that Technophilia Podcast. All right, but, but okay. So let me tell me what you think of this: the Technophilia Podcast starring Robert Weizahan with with featured guests Dave McClure <laughs> and James Bruce. You could call it whatever you want as long as uh, we get all your views. <laughs> um. All right. Uh, fuck. I don't think I have anything else I want to say. Uh, uh, you're Sidox at Sidox on Twitter. James, I'm you are. I'm at Wolfie Smith with a zero. And I'm at Robert Weasahan, W I E S E H A N. Yes. And uh, I'm sorry for weird audio problems. If I sound like crap today, it's because I'm using this microphone and not my actual microphone because I clicked the wrong thing. And uh, hopefully it sounded good. James, I got some bad news for you. Uh, for some reason, uh, OBS decided not to record uh, locally, so I don't know what we're going to do. Uh, so uh, we'll figure that out when when we get there. So I'm at uh, no. We're going to take this VOD and we're going to play it into a cassette tape recorder. 
I mean, Twitch. <laughs> Twitch is archiving it. Up. Yo, I just found a dollar in my computer chair under the armrest. Under the armrest of my computer chair, I found this crumpled up dollar. That's got to be a I sign. I pushed it in there while you were dancing for me earlier. That's now, right. Finish this podcast already. I'm that hungry. is the perfect note to end the podcast on. Goodbye, everyone.